Dear ambassadors, dear ladies and gentlemen, students, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you also for the participation. We're very pleased that you found your way to the Hertie School of Governance here in the middle of Berlin. We are also, now I don't know if the micro is working. Yes. Is it working? Okay, <laughs> I just had a feedback. Uh, we are very pleased that Christina Figueres is here uh, with us uh, today, although because of her very busy time schedule before of the Paris meeting, and today we have the Petersberger Klima Dialog today here in uh, Berlin. A um, few words about the Hattie School of Governance. Also on behalf of uh, the president of the Hattie School of Governance, welcome. Uh, the Hattie School of Governance is a private university, a postgraduate institution teaching students in public policy and uh, governance at the major program is a Masters of Public Policy, the MPP program, and also we have an executive program and a PhD program. The Hattie School is also growing very fast. Um, there is a new focus also on international affairs, international institutions, uh, and also we have a new focus on energy and climate governance, as well as energy security. So the presentation of Ms. Figueras fits perfectly into the Hattie School of Governance. It's actually the second time she's here with us. So we hope um, that this becomes a tradition and you we can welcome her here regularly. Last time you said you always come to Berlin to report about the COP and also the status about the climate negotiations. That is great for us. The timing is also great. We are in front of the Paris meeting two days, 200 days uh, in front of the climate conference meeting in uh, Paris. Climate change is one of the greatest global challenges we face. The 21st session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, or COP21, will be held in Paris in December 2015, this year. At this year's climate conference, governments will adopt a new climate agreement that will enable the world to address climate change effectively and to resilient low-carbon societies and economies. So we have an interesting signals also coming from the US, coming from China. What is Europe doing? We heard this morning Hollande and also Merkel saying about this. So what can we reasonably expect from, from Paris? So we are honored that Christina Figueres, the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC Secretariat, will share her perspective on COP21 and the world's response to climate change. Just one sentence, because she asked to be short on her CV, I will do that. Christina Figueres was appointed as an Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2010 and was reappointed the second three years term in July 2013. So I give over, hand over to her, and we are very pleased that you are here. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Claudia. I don't need a microphone. Is that correct? You can hold the microphone. Wonderful. No, no, um, so I'm going to try something new. Thank you all for, for coming today. I hear that uh, students are doing exams, which means the students are actually working and the rest of you are enjoying the afternoon. You want to take them. So yes. <laughs> see. So can we do, should we do this? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to try something new today because I tell you, um, I recently... I recently had um, the opportunity to interview Tim Cook, the CEO um, of Apple, about climate change uh, seen from the Apple perspective. And um, I was about to go up to the stage with my usual props, which, which are, are a whole bunch of little pieces of paper that are about this big. And they have you know little notes that I want to remember when I'm on stage. And a colleague of mine looked at me and he said, Christiana, please, you're not going to go upstage and talk to Tim Cook with little pieces of paper. Can you use your iPad? And I went, OK. I can type my notes very quickly into the iPad. So I take out my iPad and start typing. He goes, no, 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 no. 
It has to be an iPad that belongs in this century, not in last century. <laughs> so maybe you just go back to your little pieces of paper. So then I went up to the stage, meeting Tim Cook with all of my little pieces of paper. And as I sat down and greeted him, this wonderful gust of air came through and blew away all my little pieces of paper. <laughs> and there I was. Anyway, so um, today I'm actually going to try to use my antiquated iPad um, and see if that works uh, because I'm trying to get away of these little pieces of paper that I collect. You have no idea how my little bag is full of little pieces of paper. Anyway. It's uh, wonderful to, uh, to see you all here, and as Claudia has said, this is the second time. I have a colleague in the Secretariat who is bent and determined to make this a tradition, uh, and I've actually not lived up to his expectation because I was supposed to come here right after the, uh, the Lima COP, but uh, it's been a very, very crazy year, and so this is the first time that I'm able to come to Berlin, and why am I in Berlin? Because uh, of the Petersburg Dialogue. Petersburg being in Bonn, but the dialogue occurs in Berlin. That's just to keep everybody square about which is the capital. Um, but uh, it was uh, just, just finished, the Petersburg dialogue being headed uh, by, uh, by Chancellor Merkel and President Hollande of France. Uh, and some of you may have seen the, uh, the, the press conference. Uh, so a very good uh, day and a half of uh, informal discussions. But let me, uh, let me step back for a moment and put something actually quite um, primitive, I would say, quite primitive in front of you. If you ask me, what is the purpose of the Climate Convention? And why have you been at this for 21 years, right? We're coming up to year 21. But wh what is it that is the Convention is striving to do? So in a very primitive way, but I think a very powerful way. What the convention strives to do is to de-link or decouple two trajectories that have gone hand in hand for the past 150 years. And that is the trajectory of global GDP, call it economic growth, call it development, but a trajectory that has gone, certainly with the little wobbles up and down, but that has been in a trend toward the increase, and the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions that has also been on the rise and continues today on the rise. So those two lines, if you will, have gone hand in hand for 150 years, and the purpose of the convention is to support economic growth, to support development, but de-link that from greenhouse gas emissions. So that at the end, you would have a trajectory of growth and development that continues to go up, in particular in developing countries, who are the ones who need it most, and a, a line, if you will, of the emissions that actually goes down. Interestingly enough, that de-linking is already occurring or has already occurred in OECD countries, all OECD countries, um, and in fact, even beginning in some developing countries. But it is not a tendency that is at the global scale. And so that is the main purpose of the Climate Convention. You will understand that that's a huge effort because we've been at it for 150 years. Well, if any of us had a habit for 150 years, changing that habit would be rather difficult. My habits are 58 years old, and I still think it's difficult to break them, but can you imagine if we had a habit of 150 years, how difficult that is? Well, that is the purpose of the convention, in addition to then ensuring that the infrastructure that we build from now on, both soft and hard infrastructure, is much more resilient to uh, the negative impacts of climate change. And that's the whole chapter of adaptation, which is equally as important. Now, I would like to just briefly, see, that's the problem, because it turns off. My little piece of paper don't turn off, right? Um, many of you may be thinking, no, let me ask, how many of you right now are thinking, is this gonna be any different from Copenhagen? Please tell me the truth. How many of you are thinking that? Raise your hands. Okay, that's it? Just one third of you? Okay. Um, well, 
the fact is there is no guarantee ever of anything, but we are quite confident that A, we're going to have a different result in Copenhagen, but perhaps even more dramatically, we're working in a vastly different uh, context than the one that led up to Copenhagen. And let me put there just five issues that are dramatically, dramatically different from Copenhagen. The first and the most painful is the fact that we have had in the past six years many, many more impacts. There is not one country, not one of you, lives in a country or those of you in the diplomatic corps represents a country that has not had some kind of an impact from climate change in the past six to ten years. So, A, certainly much more of an impact and much more of an awareness of climate change because of those rising impacts. Secondly, I would say much more clarity on the part of science with the fifth assessment report. There is now no doubt that we, men and women, have created climate change, that we are living already in a completely changed, um, changed context, and that because we have created it, we have the responsibility to do something about it. Climate denialism, I would say, is probably a species in danger of extinction uh, because the science is now so, so clear um, and so incontrovertible. The third um, is that technology has certainly come to our aid. And just to look at solar technology, Germany being one of the countries that is investing very heavily into solar, solar technology has decreased cost by 80% since 2008. It has increased its efficiency by 40%. Wind has increased its efficiency by 30%. It has decreased its cost by 50%. Renewables and storage, storage is coming online. You may have seen the uh, fabulous announcement from Tesla um, just a few weeks ago of the investment that they're doing in, um, what do they call it, a power wall. A power wall that you can hang on your uh, wall at home to have power stored from your renewable energy devices. Um, so all in all, technology not only coming online at competitive prices, and in fact solar is already at grid parity in 40 different jurisdictions around the world, but also quite important, every single one of the renewable energy technologies actually beating its own foreseeable growth. So if they said that we would have X penetration of solar, that has been beat many times. And the same thing for wind. So absolutely the industry really standing up quite clearly um, and delivering in the way that the communications and information technology delivered, where technology just keeps on getting faster and faster and faster. And the same thing that, you know, how many of you already have antiquated cell phones because you just bought them six months ago? Well, the same is happening now in the renewable energy industry where the pace of innovation and development is picking up to the point where we barely can keep up. So technology definitely coming to our aid. Finance. Finance, uh, definitely a very, very different context than what we had in, uh, in Copenhagen. We had last year already $300 billion invested into renewable energy much more than we had in Copenhagen. Um, and we have green bonds coming online. Uh, we had uh, 50, no, 40 billion green bonds in, on the market last year. And the um, expectation for this year is that we will go to 100 billion in green bonds this year, plus many other new financial instruments that are being uh, created in order to facilitate the investment into renewable energy. And then finally, my, uh, fifth, my fifth factor uh, for a very, very different context than what we had in Copenhagen is sheer political will. Those of you who were around in Copenhagen or who read about Copenhagen or who were invested in the results of Copenhagen will remember that 
it was not the governments who were saying, we want an agreement. It was everyone else around the government saying, you have to come to an agreement. And beating the governments over the head to say, you have to, you have to, you have to. Well, guess what? They didn't. Uh, this time, it's very, very different. This time, it is 194 governments, all of whom consistently for the past four years since they decided that they would come to an agreement have actually been marching down the path consistently slowly yes because this is not an easy process but consistently down the path toward an agreement and we are actually on track or in fact they're even ahead of schedule with the milestones that they had um, imposed upon themselves so coming out of Geneva, just to bring you quickly up to date with this year, coming out of Geneva um, at the beginning of this year, the government's already decided on a negotiating text, way too long, over 80 pages, somewhat undigestible for sure, but there is a negotiating text that all countries have agreed to is the negotiating text. We did not have that before we went to Copenhagen. We went to Copenhagen with 300 pages of undigested, no negotiating text, it was a major nightmare. So now we have a negotiating text, and just two weeks from now, governments will come together again uh, to begin to work on that, um, on that text and begin to streamline it and organize it so that it actually can become um, the agreement. And they will then have an opportunity in June. They will have another opportunity the first week of September and a final opportunity in October, the third week of October, to clean that text and then finally go to Paris to adopt um, the agreement. As I said in the very beginning, I just came out of the Petersburg Dialogue here in Berlin, and I did not hear one country say, we do not want an agreement. Every single country said, we do want an agreement. Not only do we want an agreement, we need an agreement. We need an agreement. And we need it to protect ourselves, to protect the most vulnerable, and to protect the growth in the economy, to stir economic growth, to create new jobs, to increase energy security, food security, water security. So very much of a different attitude now of this is not being seen as a burden. This is increasingly being seen as an opportunity for growth in the long term. A very, very different context to what we had in Copenhagen. So what kind of an agreement are they heading for? Let me um, answer that question with, uh, with seven sub-sessions, uh, sub-questions. First, is it a short-term agreement or is it a long-term agreement? Well, some of you will know that I come from Costa Rica and we Latin Americans have a wonderful way of never choosing either this or that. We choose always both. Uh, and so my answer to that question is it is both short-term and long-term. Uh, why is it that? Because this agreement seeks to harvest, if you will, uh, everything that is already going on. There are amazing, amazing examples from the private sector, from cities, from states, from provinces, um, from, from investment uh, institutions, from insurance institutions. There are amazing actions that are already taking place because people can begin to see this is in their own interest to do this. So the, one of the things the agreement uh, seeks to do is to harvest all of this immediate action that is already taking place. At the same time, governments, federal governments, federal governments are already putting in their carbon management plans for what they intend to do in the time period 2020 to 2025 or 2030. So for that five or 10 year period, governments are already, which is the medium term, governments are already turning in their carbon management plans. And we in the Secretariat have received 37 of those carbon management plans. And we uh, are bound to receive quite a few more over the next few months. And then, and then this agreement is also looking at the long term because it is very clear that this transformation process, this delinking of those two curves of greenhouse gases from GDP is not something that is going to occur overnight. It is also very clear that the sum total 
of all of the carbon management plans, which are called INDCs, sorry for the acronym, but I promise it's my only acronym, intended nationally determined contributions. Those are the carbon management plans that governments are turning in. The sum total of that is not going to get us to a pathway that keeps us under the two degrees, which is what governments have agreed to. So because we know that in advance, and please, members of the press here, please do not come to Paris and then you know, scream, Eureka, we just discovered that all these plans together do not put us on a two degree pathway. I will tell you now, you heard it from me, that no, those two will not put us on the two degree pathway, which is why governments are looking at how, what do we do then about that gap? And understanding that this is a long term process, they're beginning to conceive of a long term destination, which some call climate neutrality, Others call it zero net emissions. But basically, it is the concept of reaching in the second half of the century, which is what science dictates, an ecological balance between what we emit and what the Earth is naturally able to absorb. That ecological balance, we did have that. We lost it through the Industrial Revolution, and it needs to be restored and it needs to be restored in the face of nine billion people, all of whom need to be, to be housed, clothed, fed, watered, and educated. And so a major, major uh, challenge for governments, but one that they are very committed to. Second question, is this a bottom-up or a top-down agreement? because many think of the Kyoto Protocol, which was the first legally binding instrument under the convention, as a top-down. As we will decide, as though the governments had decided, which they didn't, but many people think that they did, that what we needed was a 5% reduction in greenhouse gases, and then those who were responsible for those reductions, the industrialized countries, were all locked in a room, and I said, okay, global 5%, now who's gonna take which cut? That's actually not the way it occurred, but it seems like that. It seems like there was a top-down approach to the Kyoto Protocol. Well, in good Latin American fashion, what do you think the answer is? Is it top-down or is it bottom-up? Both, exactly. It is both. Uh, why? Because wisdom shows, history shows, that neither of those two on their own is actually strong enough to deliver the transformation that needs to be there. So the bottom up part of this is these carbon management plans that every country is putting forward out of their own national interest, out of the opportunities that they identify in their, in their own economies across their sectors, but also being guided top down by science, by science, and I really want to emphasize because this is, I think, the first time that policy in climate change, climate change policy, is truly being guided by science. I think up until now, science was over here, and policy was over here, and I see Rocio sitting here, who is probably the best, <laughs> the best witness of the fact that we had these two pillars looking across at each other but not really working with each other. And I would say this is the first time that there really is a very conscious effort for policy to be guided by science. Uh, which means that because science says we must be at this climate neutrality in the second half of the century, then we need to bring these two things together and accept the first carbon management plans as though it were a harvest Many of you understand a harvest of whatever, grapes, tomatoes, coffee in my case, but it's the first harvest, and then there will be another harvest, potentially five years after, or 10 years after. And there will be a process that they're still working on, and there was a lot of discussion at the Petersburg Dialogue, a process through which the progress from where we are, harvest one, harvest two, harvest three, will be monitored such that we should be able to close the gap that will be there in Paris. Note, there will be a gap in Paris between what we're doing and where we should be, but that gap should close over time. 
progressively over time. And that is the guidance of, um, of science. The third question that I get asked very often is, well, is this an agreement for the big emitters? Because honestly, you take 20 countries uh, and you already have 80% of the emissions. So doesn't it make sense to take, let's call them the G20, take the G20, lock them up in a room and let them solve the problem and everybody else can go to the beach and get a suntan? Well, the problem is that the beach is losing its beach. And so you can't do that. You can't lock the bigger emitters and say, you fix the problem. Because the fact is, there are many, many, the majority of countries, the majority of countries are small countries, highly vulnerable, not emitting in the past, the present, or the future, with no responsibility in the past, present, some in the future. But those countries are highly vulnerable. And so their vulnerability and their support for the, supporting them to do their adaptation needs to be part and parcel of this agreement. So there has been a decision that every country is going to contribute different ways at different paces, but every country is going to contribute, which is a good thing because you wouldn't want to have a repeat of history of what happened over the past 150 years where, let us be frank, the Industrial Revolution, now we know that it has negative effects. But the Industrial Revolution was very, very beneficial to today's industrialized countries. Today's developing countries were, in a sense, left behind by that Industrial Revolution. Let's be frank. Now, here we are at the tip of the next huge transformation in energy, in production, in consumption. Do we want those countries that were left behind by the Industrial Revolution to be left behind by this energy revolution? No. That would be fundamentally, unacceptably unfair. So in order to ensure that every country comes on board, no country left behind, it has been decided that all countries will con contribute in some way. Think about it this way. Think about Paris constructing a very broad highway, much, much broader than any Autobahn you've ever seen in Germany, a much broader highway that has many lanes such that everyone can actually choose the lane. Some will go very fast, some will go faster, some will be in different vehicles of engagement, but everybody is on the same highway going in the same direction toward the ultimate destination, which is climate neutrality, allowing for those differences along the way. Because countries have different abilities, they have different historical responsibilities. So that to the question of is it you know, just a 20 problem or is it 194 opportunity? It is 194 opportunity. Then to the question of, well, how do you ensure that there is actually progress? Because frankly, we've been watching you guys for many years. I don't see much progress coming here. Good point. Good point. Um, and so one of the fundamental decisions that has already been taken is the concept of no backsliding, which means all of these countries are putting forward their carbon management plans that will basically establish the baseline, if you will of their engagement with this issue for the first five years, 2020 to 2025 or 2030 in some cases. And then every crop after that needs to be progressively more ambitious. There's no backsliding. You can't say, okay, I did this, but now I changed my mind and I'm gonna do less. No, everybody every time needs to do more because we know that the problem is getting increasingly serious. So that concept of no backsliding is one that has already been agreed to and decided by all countries in order to ensure that over time, over a multi-decadal period, we're actually going to be able to get to the final destination. The fifth question is, how high are the fines going to be in this? If you don't do what you said you're gonna do, how high is the fine? Well. This is not going to be a punitive agreement. 
The Kyoto Protocol was a punitive agreement. There are monetary fines for non-compliance. And guess what? Somehow, all those countries who did not comply with what they said they were going to do on the Kyoto Protocol figured out how to squeeze themselves out of the fine. So fines and a punitive system are no guarantee that things are going to be done. Another lesson learned. So governments are very, very clear that this time around, this is not going to be punitive. This is going to be a facilitative character of an agreement, an enabling agreement. And why does that make sense? Because of the increasing recognition that everyone is doing it out of their own self-interest. In China's case, they're peaking coal in 2020, peaking all greenhouse gas emissions in 2030. Are they doing it to save the planet? No. They're doing it because they want to improve health conditions in China. And because even wonderful Chinese citizens want to be able to breathe the air in their cities. So it makes a lot of sense. Everybody is understanding that there is a lot to be gained from this, that there are jobs to be gained, that there is water security, that there's food security, that there is actually much more of a positive agenda around addressing climate change than there is a negative agenda. Hence, not a punitive system, but rather a facilitative system that seeks to encourage everybody to do as much as quickly as possible, and furthermore, that seeks to encourage countries to work with each other to do even more than they would do nationally. Good example, the agreement between the United States and China announced in November of last year, where each of them says, this is what I'm gonna do nationally, but these are the things that we're gonna do together because together we can do more than individually. Sixth, is this a legally binding agreement or not? Yes, it is a legally binding agreement. Does it have some degrees of legal in, legalness or bindingness in a good Latin American style? Yes. So this is not a legally binding agreement in the sense that the Kyoto Protocol was, had, was that you have a monolithic legally binding instrument that holds the same bindingness, I'm sure that that word doesn't exist, but we'll create it right now, holds the same bindingness um, for each of the components in the agreement, uh, in the Kyoto Protocol, that is not going to be the case. Now we have, again, a much more complex, you're beginning to get the idea that this agreement is much more complex than what we had previously, the Kyoto Protocol. With respect to legally binding, it will be a legally binding document. It will be a legally binding text, a legally binding agreement. But not all provisions in the agreement are going to be equally binding in the same way. Some provisions may be internationally legally binding. For example, the obligation to put in your carbon management plans, the obligation to respect the no backsliding or no backstepping principle, some things like that. But there may be other things that will be legally binding at the domestic level. And those are probably going to be the numbers, the carbon management plants. Because countries find it actually very difficult to say, what is their economy going to look like in the year 2020 to 2025? Or some of them, most of them, are putting in what their economy is gonna look like in the year 2020 to 2030. Well, you know, not even economic stu students can actually put their hand on whatever, the table, the Bible, whatever, um, and be sure that their projections are correct. So those are not gonna be internationally legally binding, those are gonna be based on um, domestic le legislation. So a combination of bindingness um, that seeks to allow countries to move to the best situation that they can, but also to give certainty, international certainty, to the process over the next few decades. And the final question, and perhaps the most important, the one that really goes to the heart of this agreement from the perspective of developing countries. The reason why this is the most important is because it is the developing countries that are gonna have the most difficult time here. Because we're asking developing countries to do something that nobody has ever done. We're asking developing countries to continue 
their growth and their development, but to do so without greenhouse gas emissions. Nobody has done that. No one. You cannot point to one country in the world that can say, I did it, I'll show you how. You can understand that that is a huge challenge for developing countries who anyway already have other development urgencies on their agenda. So the question that needs to be answered by this agreement and that many people ask me are, is this agreement going to stunt growth, in particular in developing countries, or is it going to promote growth? Fundamental and really goes to the heart of the purpose of this agreement. The answer to that can only be that the purpose of this agreement is to protect the growth that has occurred in developing countries, because if we do not address climate change, that growth is going to be wiped out. Vanuatu lost 70% of all its infrastructure in one cyclone, one. And you can name many, many different examples of that. So the purpose of this is to protect the growth that developing countries have had and to spur further growth by allowing, supporting these countries with finance, with technology, to be able to get to, frankly, jump over or leapfrog, some people call it, the kind of development that we've had over the 150, uh, last 150 years. It is an astonishingly difficult task that we're asking developing countries to do, but one that is inevitable because, my friends, there is no other option. There is no other option. Not to address climate change is so immoral, is so unacceptable to all of us that there's no other option. So people ask me, and if you don't get an agreement in Paris, what's plan B? Well, there's no plan B because there's no planet B. We are going to get an agreement in Paris. We have to get it. We're on very, very good track. There's a lot of good political will. Devil is in the details, definitely, and there are, still is a lot of work to be done. But I am actually even more optimistic than I was a year ago when I was here with you because of all of the reasons that I have put forward to you and because of this growing awareness that this is something that we want to do because it is actually good for national economies and it's good for the global economy. With that, let me stop there uh, and invite questions, comments, suggestions. I'm always hell, uh, eager for any suggestions of how to do things better. Thank you so much uh, for this excellent speech. I listened the last year, and um, I have to admit I was the one who uh, did not say I expect much from um, have after Copenhagen, and uh, now I'm much more optimistic. You convinced me that we should be more optimistic, so I'm really pleased uh, to be here and uh, be more optimistic. One uh, question before we start this uh, question. I, I'm sure you have a lot of questions too. Uh, Christina, uh, one first. You mentioned there is no plan B. You mentioned you're optimistic. What kind of role then has Europe in this whole process? USA and China, because to me, uh, you're much more into this. Um, China has changed a little bit of a position, USA maybe not, uh, and Europe has a leading role, but getting from the outside, um, I'm not quite sure whether this is really true. So maybe you can say a few sentences on this before we start with your, uh, your questions, be prepared. I see already some hands, that's sure. Um, no doubt that uh, China, the United States, and Europe, um, in the order of uh, emissions, um, have an absolute key responsibility. But there's also no doubt that they're assuming that responsibility of leadership. China, fantastic. They have, I mean, who would have believed that China would come out and say, I am going to peak coal in 2020? Right. If you had asked me that last year, I would have said, oh, it would be great, 
but let's see when they can do it. Right. So they have come out and they have said they're going to peak coal in 2020. They're going to peak all greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, they already have seven market mechanisms in seven different cities and regions. They are extracting information and lessons learned from all of those, and they're moving to a national emissions trading scheme by next year, which will put a single price on carbon in China. Once you have a national price of carbon in China, I cannot imagine that that would not have a huge ripple effect across the entire world. So China actually doing its responsibility for, re for national reasons, okay, which is exactly the way it should be. The United States, the same. The United States with a very, very difficult political situation at home, uh, and yet with the executive under the leadership of President Obama in his second term with much more political freedom, moving forward with very, very clear uh, regulations that um, are having an impact on coal, on vehicles, on energy efficiency, and on renewables, and actually being able now to put in a carbon management plan that doubles what they had said before, and being very confident that they will be able to deliver. And the European Union also, uh, they were the first ones to put in their carbon management plan with an at least 40% cut. Um, nobody is questioning whether they will be able to get there. I actually actually expect that they will be able to over deliver. So the big emitters doing what they need to do. Uh, should everybody be doing more? Absolutely. Absolutely everybody should be doing more. But for the time being, understanding that this is the first crop that is coming in, the first harvest, it's actually quite helpful to have the large emitters coming in with some leadership. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, sounds really optimistic, so <laughs> I'm really convinced. So now we start with, uh, with the uh, questions. Um, uh, we start here, I collect. Uh, yeah, why don't we collect, can, can I collect. take notes? So you need uh, the, the old fashioned. Yeah, um, see, use this <laughs> thing doesn't really work. <laughs> the old Poor fashioned Tim Cook. pen and, uh, and paper. Um, Dead left, please. Detlef Sprintz, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Thank you for your clear presentations, seven dimensions, and quite often Latin American clarity where you think we will end up. So we have a benchmark to compare notes to in January, February of next year, and I think we should do that. Mm. However, the sports question of our academics will be, can we have alternative predictions? Are you aware who else does predictions on the likely outcome, maybe with a little bit more precision than you are allowed to say in public at this stage? We had one here, yeah. Thank you, uh, Matthias Duver, the head of Climate at Ecologic Institute. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Um, looking back at the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, I thought it was noticeable how much uh, mentioning there was of the importance of climate finance for the Paris Agreement. So there seemed to be a growing recognition of that, a topic that especially also uh, developed countries have often shied away from. Uh, and the, the Chancellor made an effort in specifically making a commitment for increasing Germany's share there. Um, what is your take on this important piece of the puzzle for the Paris uh, deal? And if you were allowed to write what the G7 are, yeah, what, yeah, write a check, <laughs> that would be nice. Similar, if you were to uh, allow to write what the G7 are going to say yeah. on climate finance and their summit later this year, what would that be? Thank you. We'll take one other one and back over there. Over there. Oh, that's okay, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I'm from the Embassy of Dominican Republic. And like Costa Rica is a small country, developing country, we, and it's uh, mostly uh, big industries, tourism. So, uh, as you know, the the beaches uh, in in like the Caribbean, as in as well as other parts of the world, are suffering at big risk. And this last point you mentioned about the financing, because of these big differences, and the differences in the historical processes of development. How do you see the financing for uh, small developing countries? How do you see this will be addressed in Paris? It's only two questions. Oh, it's only two. <laughs> Let's see. Well, then we continue here. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Madam, for uh, being with us. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, International Climate Protection Fellow. I uh, just uh, want to uh, maybe compliment uh, your great remarks, if I may, on the Chinese uh, emission and coal consumption situation. Please. Actually, we had uh, uh, the last year's uh, st statistics suggesting a coal absolute consumption decline by 2.9% last year comparing to And greenhouse gases went down 1% yeah. last year. Yeah, and this is also extending this year for the first four months, we just had the latest statistics suggesting coal declined even further by 7%. Mm -hmm. So that's right. just a great thing. Yeah. I think just very important to be put on table. Uh, but my question would be on the time frame on the sort of the autobahn or highway metaphor that you just had. Um, we observe, at least I mean, uh, from the INDCs that are already on table, there are different time frames. Uh, for example, the US put 2025 as the milestone, other countries put 2030. So what will be, wha are, are you concerned uh, of this fact that everybody are competing indeed, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, on the uh, highway, but they are, you know, running on a different time frame? Would that will, I mean, will that have comparability problems, you know, in environmental integrity risks? Okay, good. Um, thank you, all very good, um, very good questions. Um, alternative predictions. Well, I'm sure you know everybody has their picture of, uh, of what Paris will turn out with. Uh, what I find particularly helpful actually is um, options that are being put on the table, in particular by think tanks, um, that already offer some solutions to the very, very difficult crunch issues, such as finance, for example. Um, and there, um, I would, well, just because I happened to read it a few days ago, I would say something called ACT, A-C-T, 2015, um, is actually a very interesting uh, take from several um, think tanks as to what they think um, might be doable in Paris. It's, it's perhaps ambitious from a political point of view. Some of the things I'm thinking, like, oh, can we get that far? But I think it's a very good, um, a very good sense um, outside of the process. And then the other thing that is happening quite, uh, quite af often already are um, different um, assessments that quantify the INDCs, the carbon management plans, and give us a sense of how far off we are from the two degree. Um, and that's being done by quite a few different, um, quite a few different institutions. So yes, there's a lot of thinking, thank heavens, right? We don't depend on only on the governments to think. Uh, and I'm very, very appreciative of academic uh, institutions and think tanks that are willing to devote time and energy into putting ideas into the, into the pot. Um, on finance, absolutely key. Um, there is no agreement in Paris unless we have an agreement on finance. That is very clear uh, because of the, uh, of the issues that I have, uh, that I have just explained uh, for the, the challenges for developing countries. But let's keep two numbers very distinct from each other. One is the political goal for financing, which is important, but is immaterial in the reality. And the other is the true goal. The political goal is 100 billion per year for developing countries coming from public and private sources. Um, and that is a political commitment that countries have made where the G7 is actually going to look at this as soon as two weeks from now on the uh, 8th of June. 7th of June, they're going to be looking at that. How can they mobilize this? And this is both public and private. And that's fine. 100 billion is, you know, important and gives certain level of trust in the conf in confidence in the system. Does that get us to where we want? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The transformation that we're talking about is in the trillions. It is probably a trillion a year. In fact, the new climate economy report that came out in November of last year puts out the, uh, the astonishing data point that over the next 15 years, not 50, 15, one five, uno cinco in Espanol, one five, okay, over the next 15 years, there is going to be 90 trillion, not 19, nine zero, 90 trillion dollars invested in infrastructure around the world mostly in developing countries, but also in OECD countries that are getting to the point of very old infrastructure that needs to be renewed. But all of the new infrastructure going into developing countries. 
That is the money that we need to keep our eyes on the ball, okay? I used to play tennis and my tennis instructor would always say, it doesn't matter how you stand, just keep your eyes on the ball. That's the whole point, okay? But you have to keep your eyes on the ball is on those 90 trillion because here's the thing. If those 90 trillion over the next 15 years are invested in the technologies and the industries and the fuel sources of last century, the calendar may say we're in the 21st century, but we, the world, will continue to live in the 19th century, okay? Or 20th. But we will be looking back the whole time. If those 90 trillion are invested in the technologies and the fuels and the kind of resilient infrastructure that we need for this century, then not only the calendar, but the world will actually be in the 21st century. That is the number that we have to keep. And that is why it's so important that Paris gives a very strong signal that we are moving down the, that, that direction. Because otherwise, those long-term investors, those who are really sitting on the trillions, would not know, do we put our money here or do we put our money there? Believe me, there is a lot of money sitting under the pillows, okay? A lot of money. And they need the signal to know which way are they going to go. Um, and the same thing to, you know, to, the, to the question of the Dominican Republic. Um, from a country's perspective, I think the most immediate access is going to be to the Green Climate Fund that has begun to be ca capitalized to the tune of 10.2 billion. That's it. It needs to go up. But more importantly, more importantly, I would say each developing country, the DR being no exception, needs to ensure that you put in place at home the regulatory framework that is going to attract the trillions of investment that need to go in. That is not gonna come out of the Green Climate Fund. That will come, if it's de-risked properly by the Green Climate Fund, that will come from private sources because that capital is sitting there and they want to invest. So frankly, the DR will be competing against Costa Rica. My ambassador is sitting here. Have a little fight with him afterward if you want. <laughs> but you know, the two of you are going to be competing with respect to you know, very advanced, very um, enlightened countries who understand that they can attract investment and that need to figure out how do they put the regulatory framework in place so that you can attract the kind of investment that you want for the kind of infrastructure that you want. Perdón, eh, embajador, pero. Como somos de la misma región. <laughs> okay, and highway. Um, no, I, I don't think it's a problem, okay? The United States is currently the only country that put in 2025. Everybody else is putting in 2030, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's like saying, well, does it matter if you have a filling station, which of course is going to be filling you with electricity, not with fossil fuels. It doesn't matter if you have a filling station, you know, at point A and point B and point C in the highway. No, because everybody has to go through that. Um, and plus, you know, it doesn't really matter. The each are, are using a different baseline. You know, some are using 1990, some are using 2005. It doesn't matter because all of that is just currency. It's just, you know, you can, you can, you, you can translate between dollars, euros, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, Costa Rican colones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can do that. Um, and the same thing with, uh, with baselines. We can translate uh, and it's no, it's no science, there's no magic. Um, the important thing is, is everybody on the highway pointing in the same direction, okay? To be on the highway and be pointing in the wrong direction doesn't get us there. So is everybody on the highway and is everybody pointing in the same direction? And that each of them will be moving in different, at different speeds, that is the reality of life. Thank you so much. Uh, we collect uh, a, a new round of, of questions, so um, raise your hand so that we know who next would like uh, to answer questions. So there are plenty one. We start over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Gürdeking. I'm an analyst at the Bundestag. Um, the question I have is, given the essential role that technology is going to play in this transition, particularly looking at the infrastructure that's going to be built in the future um, in delinking GDP from CO2 and emissions in general, why aren't we pushing for a global tech agreement? Okay, the next one was over there. Yeah. Yes, hi. I'm Reike Welp from the Free University of Berlin, and I'd like to come back to your point about the legal, um, legally binding 
uh, nature of the new agreement. You said that fees and the punitive system of the uh, Kyoto Protocol didn't always work so well, so we're now heading to a more facilitative agreement. But this would need to be based much more on trusting re relationships. And um, I think this is, uh, you were going to that direction if you said it's a, it's a bit more complex um, how, uh, which parts are legally binding, which ones are domestically um, well managed, and how do, to, how do we get to these kind of, um, well, trusting relationships that would be needed? How can countries um, trust in each other's pledges? Thanks. Yeah, they have to play. Hello, thanks very much. I'm Nina Hall, a postdoctoral fellow here at the Hertie School of Governance. I have two quick questions. Uh, the first is you mentioned that Paris is only one step towards resolving the problem of climate change and that there will be a gap afterwards. So I wondered in your position, what is the UNFCCC's role in trying to promote uh, carbon neutral growth. How do you see that moving forward? And secondly, what role for civil society in this process? You noted that at uh, Copenhagen, everyone but the governments were on board for, for change. And this morning I saw the, the protests outside Brandenburg Gate with Greenpeace of ours and other organizations. How do you think civil society can effectively put pressure to ensure governments do reach the kind of agreement you're outlining? There's another one. No. Okay, we have two one here in the front. More, and then, um, and then I think we are we are through because uh, Christina has to leave us. Thank you very much. My name is Sitona Abdallah. I am the ambassador of South Sudan in Germany. Thank you very much for this uh, informative uh, notes. And I feel now like my sister here. I have been encouraged mm -hmm. to go to Paris, although <laughs> I didn't want before. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what made me to really be encouraged to go that uh, how do you really rate or think about African country in this all this dilemma and uh, especially when they are, they take themselves out a little bit and they come back inside they say no we are not the one made the emissions but we have to benefit from it and after that they come again and say okay let us go to Paris, let us talk. And I don't know if they are in the same page like the other who are really going to Paris or not, but we want them to be in the same page. Because as you said in the finance, if they have 90 trillion, they all the African eyes, it will be for the infrastructure, not for other things. And that is what they are really doing. And how do we really can really divert their attention to what is going on in the environment. Thank you. Yeah. One final one was behind you. If you just uh, move the mic around. Then. Thank you very much, Thomas Hirsch, Climate and Development Advice. I love your picture with the highway. I have one highway-related question. Mm -hmm. Will it be a highway with different lanes, yes. but one system of rules? Yes. Or your take, please, what is your take about the rules transparency and accountability under the new agreement. Oh, you right. must have been sitting in the Petersburg Dialogue because <laughs> a lot of discussion was about that. That's wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so my day job, this is my night job that I'm doing right now, my day job is to support governments. So you will forgive me if I answer first, Madam, the ambassador's question. Um, but also, not just because you're in the ambassador, but because the African issue is front and center in this agreement. Um, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that in particular the LDCs are the countries that A, have no responsibility in the past, in the present, or in the future for emissions. That is very clear. Um, and there's also no doubt that they are the ones that are most vulnerable. Um, so that is in, in addition to, to the SIDS. Um, so that is a question that is actually being looked at quite carefully. How do we ensure that the, the Paris Agreement, or perhaps not the agreement itself, which will be illegally binding, but that there is a very direct and concrete support 
for Africa. And one, uh, one concrete um, initiative, there are quite a few that are, being, that are being discussed, but one that comes to mind immediately is UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, is championing Africa 2020 Renewable Energy, which is an initiative to really coalesce investment into renewable energy in Africa precisely because of what we said, because we know that there, the lion's share of the 1.2 unelectrified people around the world are in Africa. And if those people get electrified with fossil fuels, we have a problem. So that electrification needs to occur on the basis of our renewable energy, um, and we need to improve access to energy. Africa is the continent that has the least access to energy, and that needs to be solved. And that is much easier solved through distributed renewable energy than it is through extension of the grid with fossil. So all of those issues are being looked at. Um, I don't have the magical solution, but I know that there are um, several initiatives being looked at very specifically for, for the LDCs and for, uh, and for SIDS. Um, let me take the, the other things. Well, it won't surprise you to say, it won't surprise you if I say it is also a technology agreement. It is a health agreement. It is an energy agreement. It is a transportation agreement. It is all of these things at the same time. Margaret Chan, the head of the WHO, you know, stands up day after day dealing with Ebola as she is, but also to say the climate agreement is the most important health agreement that we've ever looked at. The head of ILO says the climate agreement is the most important labor agreement that we've ever looked at. And the same thing can be said for technology. Why? Because of the consequences of this. So we can't go in and do a, specifically a technology agreement. It is a consequence. Once countries decide we are moving down this highway into low carbon, the immediate consequence, the first consequence is what are the technologies that are going to help us to get there? And we have some of them already. We have wind, we have solar, we have storage coming on, we have geothermal, but that is not all. We know that we will need, for example, CCS, carbon capture and storage. Big question mark for this country in particular, how much nuclear are we going to need, need to solve this problem? Question mark. Um, and in fact, how many new technologies will we have to develop? But it is also a technology agreement. In fact, I would say that is the first consequence, um, is to figure out which technologies are going to help us get there. Um, highway and rules. Yes, it is a highway that has rules. Uh, right now, a very interesting discussion is, should industrialized countries have some rules and a reporting system over here, and should developing countries have other rules and a reporting system over here? That hasn't been decided. Um, I think from an accounting point of view, a ton, a ton, a ton, that is going to be standardized because that's the only way to get environmental integrity. But environmental integrity isn't everything. There is also the P word, politics. And so you do have to open up the space for developing countries to account from a, a, with rigorous methodologies, a ton is a ton is a ton, but perhaps report in a different way because they have other priorities as well. So that is very much of a discussion, you know, and when you get into the weeds of, you know, what, what is still pending, that is definitely one of the things um, that is still pending. But the intent is certainly to get everybody on the highway and with the same rules, even though they may, there may be reporting that is, um, that is different. Um, to the legally binding and the, um, the, the trust issue, absolutely important. And you know, if, if there is a word that I hear every single day in negotiations or even in informal consultations, it's trust. That is absolutely, you know, one of the light motifs there, it is trust because frankly, frankly, it's very, very difficult for developing countries to trust that their developed country partners are going to be in with them on this. So very, very difficult. We are asking them to basically jump in the cold water uh, and it's okay, it's okay, you know, we'll be there with you. Very, very difficult. So finance is a, is a big part of that. Um, and um, so is this very targeted investment, for example. Um, but also, a lot of it has to do with access to technology. A lot of it has to do with capacity building. Frankly, 
no measure of finance, capacity building, and technology access that is put on the table is enough, to be very frank with you. None, no matter how much is on the table, it is not enough. Developing countries will be called upon to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and also make a very, very important effort themselves. And I think that needs to be said very frankly. But those countries that pull themselves out of the bootstraps and are able, for example, to put in the regulatory framework should then receive the response of investment and of support. So this is about mutual trust, okay? Because developed countries also look at developing countries and go, whoa, 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 what about that money that I gave you last year? Where did that go? So you can see that there's a trust problem in both directions. And it is about building trust, mutual trust. Yes, certainly based on national sovereignty, but building mutual trust in each other and global trust in order to do this. Not an easy job, but one that needs to be done. Um, carbon neutral growth. Well, I thought the whole chat that I gave this afternoon was about carbon neutral growth. That is exactly what the whole process is about. Um, and the reason why I started saying that is the purpose of the agreement is because that is the purpose of the agreement. If you want to call it carbon neutral growth, that's a very good term to use it. But, you know, it's about this delinking of growth from, uh, from GHG. Um, and that is the whole purpose of the agreement. That's the whole purpose of the convention. That's what I have developed my, uh, devoted my life to and what everybody else over there um, is doing. You probably won't find that term. Um, in any of the texts, or maybe you will after uh, after Paris, but um, but that is absolutely at the at the heart of it uh, of everything that is being supported, and um, civil society absolutely critical mobilization. Um, I don't know if you were at in in New York in September of last year at that fantastic. Uh, March uh, just before the uh, the climate summit organized by the Secretary General, but that was a fantastic showing, right? 400,000 people on the streets marching saying, we have to do something about climate. Um, and that's a very important voice. It's a very, very important voice. And uh, may I just summarize and finish up by saying, for me, that March uh, was the beginning of a three-part call that um, I think is now on the table. What I hear from civil society consistently is that we must address climate change. What I hear from increasingly from business and from investors is that we can address climate change. So we must and we can. And what I hear increasingly from governments is that we will. So we must we can and we will address climate change with all the nuances that I have shared with you, but there's no other option. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>